Hey, thanks for joining us today. I believe God has a word for you that's gonna touch your life today, right now. So grab your pens, grab your paper, and get ready to receive a life-changing word. Before you're seated, I wanna give you this passage in week two of this series we're in, Meant to Move. Meant to Move is a series about how the church is meant to move into the world, into the parts of the world, and into the, into the ends of the earth. Acts chapter 11, verse 19 through 26. When you have it, just emoji amen, like a, like a prayer hand, or you can type the word amen, or you can type got it. Verse 19 says, Now those who were scattered after the persecution that arose over Stephen, who was stoned to death, traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch, preaching the word to no one but the Jews only. Only the Jews get God's word, they thought. But some of them were men from Cyprus and Cyrene, who, when they had to come to Antioch, they spoke to the Hellenists, which are Greek, preaching the Lord Jesus. Verse 21, and the hand of the Lord was with them too. Remember the vision last week Peter had on the rooftop? Come on, somebody who was listening. Now we're seeing they're seeing God is being delivered to the Hellenists, to the Gentiles, to the non-Jews, and God was moving on these people. And it says a great number believed and turned to the Lord. I didn't know he could touch non-Jews. I thought he was only for the, the Jewish people. How many ever had something come up where they thought they had to figure it out? And then God said, no, actually, this is how I want it. This is what it was meant to do. Verse 22, the news of these things came to the ears of the church in Jerusalem, and they sent Barnabas to go as far as Antioch. Before I go to 23, I want to give you some visual, geographical visualization here. So you have, okay, so if we're all looking at a map together, we have the Mediterranean Sea, and then we have Jerusalem, and then we have Damascus, and then we have um, uh, Antioch, and then we have up here on the northern part of the Mediterranean, we have uh, Tarsus. So, so it sounds really far away, but they really weren't that far apart geographically c compared to what we think in today's world. So Barnabas went up from Jerusalem to Antioch on his moped. And verse 23 says, when he, there's no mopeds, it's a joke, people. Verse 23 says, when he came and he had seen the grace of God, he was glad. See, remember they were preaching to the Hellenists here up in Antioch, and God was moving on the Gentiles. And so he's going, what is up with that? God is moving in a way I never thought he could do. And it says, and he encouraged them because he was glad that they all, they encouraged them all that with purpose of heart they should continue to do this. Hey, this is a good thing. If it's not broke, let's not fix it, he says. Verse 24, for he is a good man, Barnabas, full of the Holy Spirit and faith. Touch your neighbor, tell him he was full of the Holy Spirit and of faith. And a great many people were added to the Lord in Antioch. Then Barnabas departed to Tarsus because, you know, it's just a few pit stops away. He got a Starbucks. He made his way up to Tarsus to seek Saul or Paul, we call him. And when he had found him, he brought him to Antioch. So it was that for the whole year, they assembled with the church like us and taught many great people. And the disciples, the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. The first time the Bible says that we, as the body, were referred to as Christians was when the gospel was preached in Antioch. Thank you, Barnabas. Thank you, Paul. My title this morning in week two of Meant to Move as the Church is Named with Purpose. As you see this morning, this high five somebody, if it's your little kid, if it's your dog's paw, I don't care what it is, just high five somebody and tell them, I got a purpose. I have a purpose. I have a purpose. It's the first time we were named. Christians, it's the first time. You know we're named by what we're called to. We are named by what we follow. Do you know there is action behind names? There's a reason we are called Christians. But I don't like labels. So I don't like when somebody tells me what I am because then I have accountability to uphold something against what they know the label to mean. And that can be a good thing 
and that can be a bad, t- bad thing, and sometimes we call it stereotyping. And the problem with labels is it sex- sets an expectation and puts you in a box, so to speak. And stereo- stereotypes just define who you are instead of your actions defining who you are. And if they don't know how to define you, people, and they can't put a label around you, they get uncomfortable, and they don't know how to make sense of what you are to them in their, their life, what to make of you. I never forget when we started the church, we had people coming in trying to label, are you this? 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 I said, we follow Jesus. We're Christians. We use the Bible. That's it. That's all you're getting. And then they, they, they leave going, I don't get it. It's just too simple. It's too simple because if we don't understand it, we want to try to categorize you and put you in a box because that's the only way we know how to reference you according to somebody else. But God doesn't want you to be labeled that way. It's simple. And labels can be a good thing and they can be a bad thing. And it's a, it's a bad thing when they, it causes someone to prejudge the character of your intentions and instead sum you up by what they see or hear on the surface at first glance you know maybe maybe your label is a bad experience maybe y'all have gone through something that was a bad experience and now you're trying to shake the image you know like the pop star who grows up you know like I won't say Miley Cyrus or anybody like that or Britney Spears I won't say anybody's name you know I won't say anybody like that or Christina Aguilera you know they grow up all cute they grow up all cute and then they can't shake the image the Mickey Mouse Club image the Disney image so they want to go do something extreme to shake the image because every time somebody sees them they think of that image they know of them so they're trying to shake it it's hard to shake a label once someone has put a label on you it's kind of like it's kind of like it's hard to shake the calories of a nice cheeseburger it's a lot easier to consume it in this situation but to shake off those calories is much harder it's hard to shake a label. It's hard to shake a first impression. It's really hard to shake a first impression. They can be great though, labels, when your lifestyle enforces it and causes someone else to change for the better. You know, if somebody wants to go home and say, that guy follows Jesus, I pray that I uphold who I follow by the actions I live in, if they change for the better and they come to Christ, then it's a good thing. It's a good thing. And the term Christian is used very loosely in this culture, in this world. But it's more, it's more than just this cultural definition of some religious people. Just so you know, I am the least religious person on the planet. I follow Christ, and there's a difference. I am not religious. I follow Jesus. Christian is a stamp we wear that we proclaim to the world. We have stamped ourselves with the blood of Christ and wear the label proudly because of who it represents. It's a notion that we strive to model the entire essence of God. We strive, take that in, we strive to model the entire essence of who God is. And we are to wear it proudly, but humbly, transparently, but lovingly. And it can be a very difficult label to wear sometimes, especially when you're having a bad day, because our actions are meant to reflect what the Bible defines as a Christian. This is not about perfection. It's about improvement. It's about awareness. It's about transparency to yourself. The Bible is a mirror, and when you look in it, it is to reflect things about yourself. It, it, it's to bring correction for a reason. It's to make us better. God is the judge, and his word will show us new and better ways to live our life and how to model the essence of who God is. I am a Christian. Everybody say it. I am a Christian who's been named with intention and with purpose. I, we, am a Christian or a Christian that's been named with intention and with purpose purpose. The Christians have a purpose, and it's not just about feeding ourselves, because when we get full, we're supposed to go do something. They were first called Christians. What were they do, doing when they were called Christians? They were spreading one seed at a time. 
the gospel. It's the mission here. It's the mission here. We pray that the church of One Seed Church, that the mission aligns with the mission of the gospel. That is what we pray for. But the problem is that there's a scattered vision. And when you have a scattered vision in the world, there's no direct path. The vision, what's your vision? When everybody has a different vision, I'm not just talking about our church, I'm talking about people, Christians as a whole, the Christian body of Christ. The Bible says, now those who were scattered in the persecution. So they went out, literally were scattered in the physical across the regions. But I feel like in our, I, I, would, I, would, I would challenge to say in our culture, we are scattered in our vision. We're already able to get anywhere we need to go but we are scattered in understanding our vision. It's, it's become a loose term. Christianity can mean anything these days. A Christian can mean anything. But the Bible defines what a Christian is, and no one else can define what a Christian is. I can tell you all day long, only good Christians drink coffee. I can tell you all day long that only good Christians, uh, you know, you know, take take organic vitamin supplements to help reduce gray hair. Who would do that? I can tell you all, all the things long, but if the Bible is not supporting what I'm calling definition, there is an issue. And the Bible is our source to define what we claim and what we wear and what we strive to model. And that is the essence of God, Christians. Jesus was the word made flesh. He is the fullness of God. He is the father in creation, the son in redemption, the the spirit in regeneration. The essence of who he was represents the Godhead fully. The Bible says he is everything and encompasses everything. So we strive to model Christ as Christ he ends. And as time has gone on, it's gotten really complicated. Church has gotten complicated People have made it complicated. It's just in the nature of man to be complicated. You ever, you ever met somebody that they take something really easy and they make it so complicated you leave scratching your head and confused? You know, the, the Bible says that God is not the author of confusion. So, so like sometimes our, human, our humanistic uh, uh, traits can override what God intended to be. We can overcomplicate the simplicity of the gospel. It's not complicated. It wasn't meant to be complicated. People don't receive complicated. It's not for ourselves. It's for others. We give it away, and it has to be understandable, receivable, and it was never meant to be complicated. If you look at all the apostles, the original 12, and how they were found and what they did for a living and how they reached other people, none of it was complicated. Touch your neighbor, tell them it's not complicated. Touch your other neighbor, tell them, but your breath stinks, okay? Get some, get some mouthwash. I don't know how I know that. I'm just, it's a prophetic message from the word of the Lord. Get some mouthwash. Oh, five-year-olds, who knew their breath could stink so bad at eight in the morning? <laughs> but our vision can be scattered, and our vision is often scattered, and it's dangerous because we can alter God's word unintentionally and start shifting people in a direction that is not in alignment with the scriptures. And well, I don't like him telling me that the Bible is accurate in the Bible. Well, sorry, that is the mission here is to be truthful to the gospel. And the gospel is to be given transparently, but lovingly. So because we love you, we want to give you the word of God and nothing else. It's sad because all this scattering of vision in today's world of what being a Christian is about has created some bad labels. We talked about labels. You know, you all have a friend when you hear the word Christian, when they hear the word Christian or anything about God, they get like a sour taste in their mouth. Isn't that sad? Isn't that sad that something along the way skewed their perception of Jesus so greatly that they actually get negative thoughts. Now, let me, let me reiterate here. Let me, let me mention that sometimes it's not a person that caused that. It's this as our own conviction as a human being. We know that there is a God we serve. And when we are not serving God, we will hold it over our own heads and get disgruntled because really we're saying we want God. We don't know how to take that first step. That's why we say everybody is welcome. Your family, when you walk in, we don't judge you by your past. We want to we give you the purpose God has for your future. 
And so people will do that. And so whether it's, whether it's their own convictions that cause them to just run from God because they think they're not worthy, or it's someone else who, who wore the label and they wore it poorly and so poorly that it was toxic to someone ever thinking twice about God because of the, because of the, the thumping, we call it the Bible thumping or, or whatever you want to call it, they, 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 they did to this person that the person is now disgruntled. It's sad that you would have negative thoughts about the greatest love in the history of mankind. It's sad that you would have resentment and bitterness towards Jesus Christ who died for you even when you didn't know him, even though you still don't know him. He loved you that much. It's sad because if you had that personal experience to see Jesus on the cross when we all come to salvation and we see what happens in the personal, intimate relationship that Christ has for us, we would see it differently, but some of us run so far away from that because everything has been scattered and skewed and twisted and it's no longer about that. It's about bureaucracy. It's about, it's about you know, mechanics. That's not what it's about. The gospel was meant to be simple. It's easy to receive. Salvation is a free gift. It's easy to receive. God loves you. You don't have to beg him for something he said you could already have. I remember, and I have this problem, and I said I won't keep telling the church every time I repeat a story. I keep telling the church, I told this story once before, but I'm not going to tell you that I told this story once before this time. I'm not going to tell you that. I'm going to quit doing that. But this one time, <laughs> when we first started the church, so we had the Facebook page for like two years before we even ever had a service, and uh, y'all heard that story, but that's not the story here. The story is... I get this message on Facebook. Oh, another money-grubbing church in St. Charles County. Just what we need. And I have to say, it kind of hurt, but I kind of wasn't surprised because this person had an experience that led to him. And a lot of times, people's judgments are not even fair. Sometimes they'll say, so-and-so did this or that. That person did. You know, sometimes you just got to own up and say, you know what? Nobody's perfect. You, you have a relationship with God to seek it in your own right. It's nobody else's fault that you don't know Jesus. It's nobody else's fault that you don't know Jesus. You have a way. You have a right. And God will answer it to those who diligently seek him. But he had said, uh, just another, the first thing out of his, his he had, he took the time to type this on Facebook and hit send. Just another, I thought, man, you have got it so wrong. You've got it so wrong. And so, like, it made me want to, like, reach out to him. And I don't really remember what I did because I'm starting to forget things. And, 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 and Chloe could probably remember if I had told her the story because she doesn't forget anything. And so, so I, I, it made me so sad for him because I knew if he had come to our church and he had felt the love that we give and knew what we are really about, that we are genuine, we are authentic, we don't need your money, we come to share the gospel, and that when you give money, you're blessing God's house. You're not blessing me. You're not blessing a person. You're blessing God's house, and it's the Bible. All those things I just wanted to say to him in a very loving hug say man you got it wrong you should come see us but so what people do is they take that scattered vision and they run with it and they use that to stay distant we talked about sheep not coming away from the fence there's some sheep who won't even come to the fence from the other side they're they're out in the world and they'll they'll hang on to that because of a bad situation or a bad scenario they went through and 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 there's some situations uh, where Christians have, have really hurt the image of God and then we have to reap the recourse because we're wearing the same label. But as a believer, I know that no one is accountable for somebody else, that we answer to God individually and as the church. And when one stumbles, we are to lift them up to help bring them back to where they should be and not let it ruin the whole name the name above all names. And it's persecution. There is persecution. It existed back then. Remember Stephen in verse 19, he had just been stoned to death. For why? For believing in Jesus, for proclaiming the name. He was a Christian unofficially. They hadn't, they hadn't named him that yet. Remember, they didn't name him until Antioch. But persecution exists today too. Anytime you elevate change, it promotes strife. It promotes bitterness. When Jesus was on the cross, I was just refreshing this, this passage the other day. When Jesus was on the cross, even though they knew he was innocent, they didn't like the change he was bringing to the government, to the people, 
to the law. They didn't like the change. He was actually fulfilling the law. They thought he was breaking the law. They didn't like the change. So they actually asked to release the criminal off the cross. And Pontius Pilate even said, are you sure about this? This man has done it. They didn't care. See, they didn't care enough because they were persecuting against the change. So anytime you step up for Jesus, there's going to be haters Count on this joy when you are persecuted. That means you are doing something in the soil of those who cast hate. It's a scattered vision. God wants us to unscatter and bring it back to the heart of his message as the body. We are meant to deliver the gospel, not of ourselves, but God's word to the world. We are meant to go out scattered among the regions. Scattered among St. Charles County, but give God's word a unified gospel backed by his accountable word. And guess what? When you do that as the church, when you keep it that simple and you remember that this is an outreach, this is an outreach. Yes, we want to grow the body of Christ. That is the mission. Doesn't mean we stop feeding ourselves. In order to reach people, we have to feed ourselves. And as we are fed, we feed others, and it's a circle, and it keeps going, and that's how we grow God's kingdom to the ends of the earth, just like they did here by the Mediterranean Sea. As you do that, others will, touch your neighbor, tell them, they will follow. Our example determines who hears his word. Our example, every one of us has an opportunity to share his word. And that will determine who hears it. I used to always save it for the next guy. Back before I was in ministry, I knew that I was supposed to be sharing the good news, and I just didn't want to mess with it. And so someone else will get to them. Maybe God called you to get to them. Maybe God put the word in your heart and that you're feeling that because you were meant to give it to that person. Transparently, but lovingly. Don't forget the lovingly part. Sometimes you come at people too hard. They don't, they don't know how to receive it, and they put up the, the fists transparently but lovingly through grace, gracefully. Others will follow. It says many got saved because of the disciples' witness. We are disciples. Did you know that? Did you know you're a disciple? You are a follower of Jesus. You're a disciple. And that someone could be freed to heaven for eternity because of your discipling. That's what we are to do. That's what Christians are. It is the disciples of God spreading the gospel. The people that believe saw the God of grace. Do we show grace? Ooh. Hmm. Do I show the grace of God in my life? Do we show the grace of God in our lives? Sometimes. I'm a Christian who's been named with intention and with purpose, and do I show the grace of God in my life? Do I show the grace of God to my children, or do I show them the devil? Can I be real with y'all? Depends. I've shown them both. And that doesn't mean it's okay. That means that awareness is to help me remember not to do it again. And we can, we can show the grace of God in church, but then we can give someone the finger in traffic. Yeah? <laughs> we call it the bird here in St. Louis. I don't know if y'all heard bird, bird, bird. The bird is the word. Anyway, you want to make somebody mad in St. Louis, you give them the bird on the freeway, and that's not showing the grace of God. That's showing the grace, the lack of grace in uh, our human. And I'm not saying I do that. I'm saying, uh, no, I have, I have done that way back in the day. I've done a lot worse than that. You don't want to go there. But what I'm saying is when we claim the name and then we go out and display something else, we're confusing the believer. Oh, that's good. When we, it's simple, but it's good. When we claim the name of Jesus and we wear it boldly and people say, that guy's a Christian. He's all about his church. And then we go out and we party like rock stars and we, 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 we do everything they do and we show no difference. They go, well, that's what they do. I guess it's okay if I do it that way. Now, that's a long topic. What I'm saying is there's accountability. Too much is given, much is required. We are blessed because we are also entertaining to be accountable. We reap the blessings of of a good life, but we work hard for it in life, right? You want to reap the blessings of a good job and a good career, what are you going to do? You're going to work hard for the cause. And that's what we do. We believe in working hard for the cause of Jesus Christ because we know how good 
the blessings are. We want to build his house. We want a building. And you can call it carnal, but we do want a building. Why would we not want a building? We, we can't wait to get a building someday. We make jokes about it because we're just going to like flip switches. We don't even know what to do with ourselves because we're so used to sweating and grinding like John Wayne and setting everything up and tearing it down every week. And Nate will be hugging me every week when all he has to do is flip a switch. Because, but, but guess what? We love all that even in the season we're in because we are working for what God is going to bless. And that doesn't mean we're working for the blessing. We're not trying to earn a blessing. It's the favor of God. It's the grace of God. But we want to work for the kingdom because we believe in the mission. That's why we do it. That's why we do it. Others will follow too. And that's where fulfillment comes in. That's why you are meant to be fulfilled as a Christian by living out the gospel's mission. It's that simple. When you feel empty as a Christian and you don't know what is going on, you have, to, you, have to, you have to stop and check yourself and say, what am I doing? How much time am I in God's word? How much time am I in sharing anything about Jesus? How much? I heard a good quote years ago. And it was kind of corny, but it was kind of, kind of true. It said, if being a Christian was a crime, would there be enough evidence against you to convict you? If being a Christian was a crime, would there be enough evidence against you to convict you. And I remember going, no, there'd be no evidence because I don't, I don't really share anything. But I'm a Christian. I'm not, I'm not hating on people. I'm trying to explain what the Bible says is the mission and what they were doing when they were labeled Christians. Remember, church, we're meant to move. We were meant to move. And we were named with a purpose. We are named with intention. Our purpose is to walk with God in everything we do. And they saw the grace of God. They saw the grace of God. We speak loudest with, no, not our mouths, our actions. We always, we always say faith is belief in action. You step by step, it's all the same. We speak with the life we live as individuals, and as one body, we call church family. See, something happened in the scripture. Something happened in one seat church. Something happened in any type of movement for God. And that was people saw lives changing. And when they saw something, they say, didn't say they heard lives changing. They saw something happening. They saw the revival taking place. They saw the changed hearts of, of, their, of their peers taking place. And that is what caused thousands of others to follow. It was contagious because it's in the human, it's in the humanity of man, it's DNA to know there is a God who loves them and they're looking for a way to follow. And when they see you get changed and that you live a, a way they never thought was possible, they want to do the same and they will follow. It was intentional. God's plan is intentional. It was not an accident. God's word was intentional, established from the beginning, yet not come to fruition. It was the plan of redemption yet to take place. Just because it hasn't happened yet doesn't mean it's not going to take place. That's what belief is. I believe it even though I haven't seen it yet. I believe it because I'm going to see it when it happens. I'm not waiting to see something before I believe. It was planned from the beginning. And not only did these people get touched because of what they saw then, but God's word was falling on them in their hearts. And God is the one who increased their knowledge, increased their understanding, and opened up their hearts to receive him. That's what did it. It was intentional. You weren't an accident. You have a purpose. Look yourself in the mirror right now. If you feel this way and say, I am not an accident. I have a purpose. I was calculated. I was strategic. God put, put a plan in my life from the beginning, way before my grandparents, 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 before the foundation of this country, before the foundations of the heavens and the earth. God put a plan together for you. Look in the mirror and say, I have a plan and I have a purpose, and I am not an accident. I am God's child, and I have been commissioned 
by the gospel of Jesus Christ to live out this mission according to his word, not my word. And when I figure that out and I go tell my neighbor and they figure that out and when the whole church figures that out and we do it together, that vision that was scattered is now unified and now we are reaching the world and changing the world. Come on, somebody, just give them a praise for five seconds right now if you believe that because it's going to happen. It was intentional. It was going to happen. God wants to use you. You were made for this. You were made for this. This message right now is to tell you you were made to live out the gospel. It is. And anything else is just our selfish wants. It doesn't mean we can't have nice things. It's, but we have to remember what we are here to do first. It doesn't mean we can't have nice things and like have a nice steak dinner and go grill and like go on a boat ride and, and go on the lake and take vacation. It doesn't mean we have to become a slave in a, in, a, in a negative way. It means we are servants of Christ first. And what comes with that is a blessed life. And we can, we can have all those things. But we can never forget why we wear the label we wear. Otherwise, people will water down down what they think of us and what they think of God's word and that has to be first we are a Christian we follow Jesus first 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 he is the priority it says Barnabas full of the Holy Spirit and of faith we need the Holy Spirit to have faith we have to move through the spirit moves through us and it says as the spirit moved people were added to the Lord it's God who gives the increase it is not of ourselves the spirit worketh through us us and that is how God does it amen come on somebody I just I can't wait till August 2nd I can hear those those praises for God because that lifts people up when they hear the praise and they hear the worship and they hear the unity in God's house that lifts the anointing in the room and hearts are stirred and God starts moving in that place As you walk through this life, never forget you were called and created with intention. When you walk through this life and you know that God created you with intention and with purpose, you will walk differently. You will walk through life differently when you remember you were created and planned with purpose and intention and you were not just chance you were not just a luck of the draw you weren't just a dice roll from your mom and dad it wasn't just just unplanned no maybe they didn't plan you but God did see we're people we don't know how 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 we're going to get here but we know that if we're here God God wanted us to be here and had a plan for us to be here there's a reason we're alive. There's a reason we're breathing and God's not finished. If y'all could stand with me right now as we close. How does the church get on fire for God? Well, he's really good. He gets really fired up in his basement and all that. Yeah, it takes more than that because that, that fire will go out if that's your only high. The fire is to light a fire up in you. That's the Holy Ghost burning inside of you so that when you come to church, you know, I'm on a mission when I come here. I'm not here just to watch a show. I'm on a mission to, 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 to be a light to the world. And then I'm going to take that throughout my week and I'm going to spread the gospel. And every Sunday I get better. And then as the weeks go by, I'm better and I'm spreading the gospel and now people are coming to Christ because of what I did because of my my works for God I am being used dry bones will come to life inspiration will revive in souls you thought were dead and gone yeah that relative you thought didn't give a rip about anything you said about Jesus they were listening the whole time and just because you didn't know it God did so don't dry up don't forget because God will replenish the soul that is barren he will create a burning consuming fire that you thought was barren you didn't think a baby could be born Sarai you thought you thought he had to go get with the maid servant Abram you broke God's rule and God said I had it going the whole time if you just had trusted and listened I would have gave you Isaac but you went for Ishmael because you doubted what I said God's got you 
Be patient. Be faithful. Seek and ye shall find. Knock and it shall be opened unto you. He is a rewarder of those who diligently, everybody shout it, diligently seek him. You've been looking for something to get you up in the morning and this is it. God, we come to you right now with hands lifted high and heads bowed. We are thankful that we are going into chapter three. We don't know what day it is for sure, but even if it moves, God, we don't care because we know it's going to happen according to your promise and your word. And even if it moves 10 times, God forbid, if that's your will, then thy will be done here on earth as it is in heaven, that your will be done, your kingdom come, so be it. Amen. God, touch this house touch this church bring dry bones back to life let them see that there's to be a fire a consuming fire going out of this church and into the world and when they want to see god move in one seat church this is how we do it god we pray that we remember the mission and that we're unified throughout the week and that we stay protected by your loving hand and we can't wait to be back together and praise with you and worship you lord we can't We can't wait to be back in community with each other, God. Touch all those who are sick right now, all those who are battling right now, all those who are struggling right now, all those who are fighting something right now. They don't know it's the enemy attacking them, but we do, God, and we cast that out right now in Jesus' name. Give them peace, God. Meet them in the middle of their storm and know that let them know that you are the peacemaker and you will make a way for them to find a brighter tomorrow. And if the house of God can say, In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, thanks again for joining us for today's message. I pray God spoke to your heart directly and left you with a word that's leaving you blessed and encouraged throughout this upcoming week. If you'd like to partner financially with us, you can go to oneseedchurch.org slash giving.